everybody, it's Tyler here at Vex Rolls, checking in Vex U Team Pyro out of Arizona State University. Wow, Pyro is absolutely incredible. A 70 pound primary robot that they have here. And look at this overall, these incredible tanks that are holding compressed air. And that's their strategy, blowing out compressed air and actually uh, craziness of getting those tri balls knocked out as well too. So we're we'll taking a deep dive into this robot so far, talking about their drivetrain, their electronics, why they even went this route and some of the strategy behind it coming up here on Pits and Parts. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. The Robotics Education and Competition Foundation provides fantastic programs for students from elementary school all the way through college. These include VEX, Aerial Drone Competition, Online Challenges, JROTC, Grow Powered, Scholarships, Certifications, and so much more. To discover these exciting opportunities, visit recf.org and get connected. We got to go into the why factor here in this robot here. Like this is an incredible machine, but why did you even choose to go this route? How did you even come up with this sort of strategy in the first place? So we originally came up with this strategy last year when we realized that the VEXU rules allowed us to use uh, air to descore uh, game elements. Because usually the rules aren't explicit about uh, descoring being against the rules. It's about how you descore. So by using air, we can uh, get around those rules and do things that we wouldn't normally be allowed to do. For instance, the, for this for this game, you can only descore when you're double zoned. By using air, you can descore the goal without actually entering it. So you can descore at any time, which is a, a huge improvement in the reliability of the robot because your strategy can be consistent. It doesn't rely on what your opponents do. Something I want to ask you, uh, I was told by somebody else that that was kind of like the first question asked in the Q&A this year is in regards to if that strategy was legal. So when you saw that, uh, that that was something that was okay, was this immediately to the thought of just having these massive tanks or like, how'd you go about like getting to this product itself? Yeah, definitely. So Max from uh, team, VEXU team Ghost asked that question. And we were originally like super disappointed because we already had it on our minds because we, you know, we just came out of uh, using an air tank last year to sure. score. So we, of course, that was an idea we had and it was like, oh no, it's, they're, they're gonna say it's not allowed. We were, we were so afraid it was gonna get ruled illegal. And they didn't, they said it was fine. So it was like, well, I guess we got to do it. We got to do something with this, right? Um, yeah. Cool. And looking at, you know, this robot here, obviously like one into it, we're not going to go too much into your other robots as well, but what sacrifices did you have to make when you build something like this for your second robot that is much more mobile on the field? What kind of sacrifices did you have to make in regards to limiting that other robot as well? Yeah, so this robot is huge, heavy, and it cannot go around the field very much. So that means because it has like no other mechanisms other than descoring, there is like no tandem strategies. We can't, the other robot has to stay on the other side of the field because this one can't cross. So unless, unless if, the, if the 15 inch comes onto uh, the side of the field that this side's on, this spot's on, then we, we're double zoning and we can get descored on. Additionally, it gets in the way. We have to move it out of the way in auto so that we can actually like use the match load zone and other things like that. And since it, the only thing this robot can do is descore, the other robot has to try to pick up all that slack from this robot not scoring or match loading or anything. You and I were talking uh, earlier, kind of a funny story is with this robot being 70 pounds, that uh, inspection was kind of an interesting process uh, for you to get away. Can you just tell me more about that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, they, they don't let us, uh, they wouldn't let us roll this in uh, over the carpet, so we had to. We had to carry it. It takes two people to carry this. So to get it on the field or the inspection table, we have to have two people carry it. And then because of how uh, different this robot is, they uh, immediately had to call the higher ups to get them to uh, give us get, give the go ahead. I think that's so a can, compliment, really. Yeah, if you think definitely, about that, so. we're, we're, we're flattered. Uh, and then the run 70 pound robot on here, talk to me about your motor configuring in regards to your drivetrain, break all that down, how your drivetrain works. Yeah, so there are 17 motors on this drive, which is fine for VEXU because we don't have a motor limit. So, oh, so, so, so 17 motors on the robot. One of the motors is used to spin the barrel. The drivetrain has 16 motors on it. So each side has eight. Uh, and it, since it's a mechanism drive, there are uh, uh, four motors per two sets of wheels. Um, can we can we lift it up so we can see the bottom? So there's four motors that you can see on either side on the outside, and then there's four motors underneath near where the air tanks are. So what's the total wattage of this then? Um, about 172. 
Okay. So. Something I want to ask on here is talking about some of the testing that goes into this as well, too. I mean, I, I cannot imagine like the process that went through in regards to like, hey, this robot got made. Now we got to actually figure out if it works and that sort of thing as well, too. So uh, in a moment, let's pass over to Charles to talk more about uh, the testing behind it as well. Uh, we're not going to fire it off in here. We got some great footage of that otherwise, but we'd love to just see that barrel rotate a little bit more and, and talk to me about how it works. Yeah, sure. So when we have a, a, a control the air, a, release of air like this, where there's a lot of air, there's a lot of energy involved. We want to do a lot of testing to make sure that we characterize the behavior of the system very, very well. So we tested at a variety of pressures at, a, and we also measured sound levels at a, a, a variety of distances, just to make sure that we're not going to hurt people's ears and stuff like that. And ultimately we did discover that it is fine for like uh, hearing and stuff like that. It's not going to hurt people's ears. Um, it's within OSHA limits and stuff like that. Uh, unless you're just sitting right next to it for an entire day. Sure. Um, it only happens for a fraction of a second, so the, the sound levels are not that big of a deal. Um, and we can also, yeah, so uh, one thing I can also talk about is the uh, slip ring that's on the back here. So the, the um, tanks are actually have powered solenoids wiring to the tanks that rotate in here. And the tanks can rotate continuously. So you might wonder how we can get wires to a continuously rotating thing yeah. without the wires getting tangled. And what's actually happening is that there's what's called a slip ring in here, which allows for a continuously rotating mechanism like this to have an electrical connection through the shaft that goes through the entire mechanism. And then that wires come out of the slip ring and then go, goes into the V5 brain here. So that way we're able to have a continuously rotating mechanism that has electronics on it. So last year we had on our air tank, we had a large ball valve that was actually run using V5 motors. We needed four motors just to actuate the one ball valve and it would often get stuck. It was a big problem last year. Last year we had to fill up the tank like a minute before our match, otherwise it just wouldn't open. We wanted to fix that for this year. So these tanks don't have ball valves on them. They have this, uh, they come like this from the, the, the off, they're off the shelf like this. These are pneumatic valves inside of here. They use the, a difference in pressure between inside the tank and atmosphere to push this back. And, and open the open the air uh, tank. This results in the air coming, the, the valve opening a lot faster than the ball valve, and it means they're a lot more effective. And so to do this, there's a there's a switch right here that vents to atmosphere. We tried using a solenoid to do it, but it did directly do it, but it didn't have enough of a high enough flow rate. So this little switch is the manual switch that is on the tire seater that the, that the user would use to open the valve. So we have a cylinder that. That, that physically pushes the switch. And this cylinder runs off of air from inside the tank. So this is all a self-contained, each tank is its own self-contained system and triggering. And then this solenoid is what actually uh, fires the tank by, uh, by pushing that button. And then that's those, that, that power is what goes through the slip ring and gets uh, controlled by the brain. I want to ask you uh, from the testing on this, what made you determine like these were the right size like other tanks that you want to go with uh, on your robot? Yeah, so mainly it was about sizing and staying in size. So a lot of the air tanks you'll find online, they'll either have like a big valve that sticks out the top or like a non-removable nozzle or something like that. And then those tanks are only gonna fit within like a diagonal of the 24 if you're lucky. The issue also is that there's only a, one tile beside the goal. So if we wanted to shoot sideways into the goal, a bigger tank wouldn't fit. This is basically the maximum length of tank that could possibly fit. Um, we also wanted to have multiple shots because we wanted, since last year, one of the issues was that we could only de-score once and at the very end of the match. So there was, a, there was a little bit of worry that if somehow we got pushed away from the goal, then we wouldn't be able to do the de-scoring. And that almost happened, but luckily we did manage to, to get it most times last year. But this year we wanted to have that flexibility to fire the tanks off multiple times in the match and clear the goal multiple times. When I was watching your last match, it looked like uh, when your tanks were routine, you can almost kind of get a side shot a little bit on that. Um, is that something that was just born on necessity you found or did you design it to where it's like, hey, we, we don't have to just shoot from the bottom, we can actually shoot from the sides as well. So the design is to shoot from the bottom mainly, just because that's closest to the balls and because the bar that uh, is horizontal on the goal is um, at the height that's basically this, this bar right here. We want the goal to be the tank to be below that point so that it's aiming directly at the tri balls. Uh, and because we have multiple tanks, we couldn't really arrange all of them at once to be at that level, just didn't be within size. So we had to have the rotating mechanism 
to rotate a new tank into place to fire the tribals. When you had a reveal video come out of this, I think you were testing at 150 PSI, is that correct? It's about, one, about, about, about 120 PSI. PSI. But you're limited to 40 here on there. When was that decision made uh, by the uh, design committee or rules committee on that? Yeah, so we, like I said, we do a lot of testing to characterize behavior of this robot. Uh, this past week, we were just testing extensively and we came to the conclusion that um, we wanted to run at 40 PSI, no higher for matches. The main concern being that we don't want the tri balls to be shot out of the field and you know potentially hit someone or something sure. like that. Um, it's disappointing because the effectiveness is not quite as high, but we just want to make sure that we're safe. So that 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 was just came out of the result of a ton of testing this past week. Last thing I want to ask you before we pass it over is: uh, Have you seen any teams kind of play some counter defense against that as well? Like, what have you seen so far? Out of um, that? So far, we haven't seen too much counter defense. Um, there was there was one match where there was kind of a pushing match between these two, um, but I think this one won the pushing yeah, match. Yeah, it's a bit of a break. Uh, huh? so, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, not not so much in the way of counter strategies because. Uh, if we think that someone's going to counter us, we can always, where this robot starts is where it can fire from. So there's no real way of removing the robot from where it starts. Sure. The, you, there's no you, one like, that has a Could you like park on the other side of the goal or anything like that to try to prevent So this robot can, can park on either side of the goal. So it oh, does okay. have that option. So if it does, if we end up driving around and it does encounter defense on one side of the goal, it can totally move to the other side of the goal and fire from there too. I'm not going to lie, I would absolutely love to just see this robot just completely dominate another robot on the field at some point, so I look forward to seeing that as well. Uh, Mayo, uh, let's talk about uh, some of the aspects in regards to uh, programming sense. We talked a little about the electrical, the slip ring, but I'd love to hear more about, uh, on your side of thing, like what really went into the details of getting this robot just right. Uh, yeah, so one of the key things that we wanted to make sure uh, happens during driver control is the easy control of the uh, revolver. And so you notice it's very hard to tell which tank is actually on the bottom. And so what we have is we have three limit switches right here. And you notice on the tanks, we on the on the on the aluminum box boxing, we have these three 3D printed parts on each one. And each one corresponds to a limit switch. And so anytime it's pressed, we know which tank is at the bottom. And so we can just go through and cycle it. We have a calibration step and then we can just go through and cycle it to the next one, and it stops at the limit switch. And so the reason why we do it this way is things are going by fast. We have a minute 15 for driver control, and uh, we don't have time to be thinking about manually positioning. And so adding that on helps us to uh, just have a really fast cycle time and get through all the tanks. Anything else from a programming standpoint uh, in regards to during the match, like, uh, do you use any other sensors in regards to like localization or anything like that? Or it's just because this robot is just really where it needs to be, that's how it is. Um, is there anything from your secondary robot that you maybe takes into consideration on that? Yeah, sure. So in terms of localization uh, on the 15 inch, because the 15 inch moves a lot around a lot more in autonomous, the 24 inch kind of just gets out of the way and touches the bar for AWP. Whereas the 15 inch has to do almost all the scoring yeah. in auto, sorry, all the scoring, not almost all the scoring. And in order to make sure that our autonomouses are reliable and accurate, we have odometry wheels here. These odometry wheels are using uh, off the shelf RS45 absolute position encoders. These are similar to the V5 rotation sensor, except they're four times the resolution and they communicate digitally with the V5 brain over the smart ports. Um, we also have custom uh, uh, odometry wheels here. And because the wheels are smaller, that allows us to measure the distance between the wheels more accurately, which allows us to get a more accurate uh, heading measurements on the robot. And then they're also sprung on custom 3D printed encoders, sorry, custom 3D printed enclosures, so that they're always in contact with the ground. And then in order to power the, uh, I'm not sure if it's that, that easy to get. In order to power the um, encoders, we have these custom uh, PCBs that we've designed and manufactured that, in, in, that allow the RS-45 communication to pass through the brain, but then convert the brain's 12 volt power into five volt power for the encoders, which allows us to use them. So. Awesome, well Pyro, what a phenomenal uh, set of robots you have here. This is definitely the coolest one I've seen so far. So uh, really great to see it uh, function on the field as well too. So congratulations on your innovative design for sure. And good luck here at uh, Bex, uh, Bex World as well too. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tyler.
This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. The Robotics Education and Competition Foundation provides fantastic programs for students from elementary school all the way through college. These include VEX, Aerial Drone Competition, Online Challenges, JROTC, Girl Powered, Scholarships, Certifications, and so much more. To discover these exciting opportunities, visit recf.org and get connected. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Most live shows can be found on the First Updates Now YouTube channel, live competitions at twitch.tv slash firstupdatesnow, and join our Discord at discord.gg slash firstupdatesnow. Check our other social offerings on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.